Welcome to the official Warrior podcast from Max. I'm Lisa Ling, a journalist and Warrior super fan. And I'm Hoon Lee. You may know me as the actor who plays Chow, the friend to everyone, and I'm also a writer on the series. That's right. As your host, we'll be breaking down every episode of Warrior Season 3, and we'll learn more about how this incredible new season came together through interviews with the creators, cast, and crew. We'll also be discussing the very real historical events and people that inspired the characters and the story of Warrior, including Bruce Lee, whose writings actually inspired the entire series. Today, we're diving into Episode 4, In Chinatown, No One Thinks About Forever, written by Francisca X. Hu. We'll be joined by the talented and beautiful Olivia Chang, who plays the badass and ever-so-stylish Ah Toy. We'll talk about the ways Atoy has grown and changed since season one, and how her role as a brothel owner and madam empowers her and other women in this patriarchal world of tongs, fighting, and political backstabbing. But before we get started, there will be spoilers, so go watch episode four before listening. Go watch it. Watch it. <laughs> Do it. So Hoon, very much like your character, Olivia's character, Atoy, she really is her own boss. She's her own person. She's not owned by the Tongs. And with a few personal exceptions, she's just this independent woman with, I might add, a great deal of influence and power. That's right. Uh, Atoy's brothel is actually in Hopway territory, but it's really a tribute to her independence and the power that she's built, that she maintains um, her position as a business entrepreneur and is not tethered to the Hopway. Well, one of the things I really love about Atoy, I mean, she she's just, she's so smart mm. and cunning and has this wit about her. And I mean, of course, her fashion. Yeah. <laughs> um, the, the costumes for the show, they really set us up in this world. Um, you know, the Long Zs are more modest and traditional versus the Hop Ways, like suave Armani looking suits. But Atoy, her wardrobe just really is so attention grabbing. Yeah. And I mean, they'd spend a lot of time letting the costumes inform the story and letting the story inform the costumes. Um, and I know Olivia spends a lot of time sort of making sure that those things harmonize with her looks and her makeup, et cetera. And, you know, Olivia is an incredibly accomplished actress. We're incredibly fortunate to have her because not only is she able to deliver um, the elegance and the beauty and the panache of a toy, but also she's incredibly physically capable, which is, of course, an incredible a prerequisite for this show. And um, she's able to deliver the wit and the sophistication of it. And Olivia is also uh, very involved in in uh, issues that are important to her. And the grounding of that helps give Atoy a spine throughout the show. Yeah, she really, Olivia, the the human, the activist, really brings such complexity to the character of Atoy. And I mean, I, it's just so impressive to me. Yeah. And her confidence is something that, you know, you don't think about it that much, but to pull off some of the looks that she does, um, it requires this incredible amount of poise. And for a character like Atoy, it's not just clothing and it's not just accessories. It's a uniform. You know, it's a way to present to the world and a way to confront the world in her particular case. I think it's fascinating that there was a real Atoy in history. And um, she was a Chinese woman in the 1800s, but she was able to amass some sway and 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 some juice during that time and was really unafraid of using her power, which I just think is impressive and incredible to think about. And that's the seedling that uh, the creators took in order to sort of develop and elaborate upon to create our version of Atoy. Um, yeah, it's a fascinating character and obviously beautifully portrayed. So let's get to it by starting with our usual episode recap of episode four. Nellie tells Atoy that Strickland won't get away with what he's done. Atoy, Lai, and the rest of the girls leave Nellie and her vineyard behind and head back to Chinatown. No, Atoy, wait! You cannot take these girls back to the brothel. We worked so hard to get them out of that you life. You know, protect them. You know, protect them here. In Chinatown, I can. Mai Ling spends more time at the Pendleton house. Bernard offers to hold Mai Ling's money at the bank and their financial dealings progress, but then he makes a move on her, which Eliza sees from afar. In court, Strickland wins the right to Nellie's land via eminent domain. You just couldn't stand not having something that you wanted, so, so you took it like a, like a petulant child. I can see you're upset, but I'm afraid I don't know what you're talking about. You killed them. You murdered my girls, and for what? For more money as if you didn't have enough. You are sick. 
Douglas, you are a twisted, despicable creature. Lee and the Chinatown squad raid Hopway headquarters looking for the printing press, and they arrest Yong Jun and take him away. The police arrive to arrest Mai Ling for criminal solicitation. Mai Ling tries to tell the truth about Bernard coming onto her, which earns her a slap from Eliza. Fully aware of the consequences for Mai Ling, Eliza watches coldly as she's pulled away from the officers. I hope they send you back to China. Eliza, please, Eliza, stop them! Eliza! So, Hoon, uh, let's talk about something here. The theme for this episode is women in power, how women hold power, do they even truly have power, and the various forms of currencies, whether that's violence, money, politics, land, or sex that women um, have to use to get that power. That's right. And we see in this episode, Atoy um, is confronted with her greatest fear about running away with Nelly, which is that this is a fantasy, that maybe this isn't something that's allowed to her, not only as a woman and as, as an entrepreneur trying to make her way in the world, but of course, as an Asian woman and as a woman of a certain class. Um, and so, you know, building something together doesn't mean it's foolproof. Right. And, and, and you see this, the limits of even this white woman's power, right, which culminates in the courtroom. That's right. Um, it surprises Nellie when the judge rules in favor of Douglas Strickland, um, taking Nellie's land through eminent domain. And Atoy realizes that she alone can only protect the girls. Like she um, can't rely on this, even this white woman, right? It, 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 she has to be the one, even though she's in the relationship. And I think trusts her. Yeah, and we're we're learning in this season. We're expanding beyond the the conflicts that we've established in the first two seasons, which is sort of the Irish versus the Chinese. And now we're looking at okay, what are the other tensions that exist here? What are the other people in play, and who is actually the enemy um, at any given time? And what we're seeing in this particular episode, illustrated most clearly, is the dynamic of um, who who in the male world has power and how do they hold control over that over the women. Going back to something that I found particularly interesting, looking at Atoy's fashion, and in some ways she uses that fashion as her armor, and, and we see this very, very clearly in the episode um, when she goes back to Chinatown and goes back into the brothel after having been, uh, you know, in the vineyard for so long. You see her covering her scars with makeup, and she just transforms back into this madam who goes on to run the brothel with some girls from the vineyard. And Assam even goes to her room and tells her that she needs to take a break, but she is just completely determined to get back to business. And you just, you, you get the sense that she realizes that this is sort of where she belongs, you know, that while she may have hoped that things could be different, right, for people like her, um, Chinatown is... Um, where she believes she needs to be, but how society or where society believes that she needs to be. Yeah, and a large thematic for this season, not only with uh, Atoy, for example, but with a lot of the characters is sort of like uh, the risk of flying too close to the sun, reaching for that thing that you want, that you think is beyond the world that you know. And uh, the, the, the season starts asking the question, are you ready to deal with the consequences of that if it doesn't work out? It is interesting that both Mai Ling and Atoy really believe, they want to believe that they can find a kind of security and legitimacy outside of their world. But sadly, they find out that that is not the case. Um, I'm particularly interested in Atoy's character because, you know, I think that we now, we, we have a certain perception and concerns about how Asian women have been portrayed in the media. And um, I think it's important to recognize that this is a show you ha you you cannot forget the context in which this show right. is is existing, um, and so I'm really anxious to get into this with Olivia. Yeah, and you know that's something that um, Olivia is very cognizant of, and she's very aware of. You know, and over time, the the risk taken by the creators, but also hopefully the thing that leads to a greater payoff is that those expectations get subverted, the characters get fleshed out, and what seems on the surface as a two-dimensional sort of affectation becomes a three-dimensional person that you end up caring about and understanding at a deeper level. 
Yeah, I'm glad you mentioned that, Hoon, because I, in the be- very beginning of season one, I definitely felt triggered mm. by seeing those those tropes. But as the show evolves, you start to see these characters um, just become so much more complex. And you are not only rooting for them, but um, they kind of take on these heroic uh, dimensions, which I, which I just loved. And last week we chatted with your co-star Andrew about what it means to be an Asian actor in the industry and how Assam has really changed through the series. But this week we're going to continue that conversation with another one of your co-stars, Olivia Chang, to talk about power and how women are able to grasp it in the show. A toy is really based off of um, someone who existed in real life. She was a Chinese woman of the same name during this period uh, who had an incredible life, long life of uh, challenging norms and fighting for her place in society. And really, she was the progenitor for the the masterful creation that Olivia's been able to to bring to life. Yeah, one of the few real-life characters on whom the characters in the show are based. And uh, I can't wait to talk to Olivia about it. But a little bit about her first. Olivia Chang was born in Edmonton, Alberta, to working-class Cantonese-speaking immigrant parents. Before launching her acting career, Olivia was a fellow journalist working for Global TV, Lethbridge, and ET Canada. And in 2014, she landed a leading breakout role in Netflix's Marco Polo. Since then, she's been in Sci-Fi's Deadly Class, Apple TV series C, and directed her first short film, Dinner with Dex, which premiered at the London International Film Festival in 2021. Olivia Chang, thank you so much for joining us on the podcast. Now, we've kind of established that Chow is our favorite character because he's one of the hosts of this podcast. Um, <laughs> and also objectively unfair. the best character. Objection. I thought we established... Objection. That he's objectively the best character. (laughs) I didn't say it. Well, all I'm saying is, aside from Chow, you are my favorite character. Uh, Atoy is my favorite character. I just think you play her so brilliantly. And I love her evolution throughout the seasons. But I want to know from you what it was about this character of Atoy that that compelled you to want to play her. Oh, um... I think what compelled me about Atoy, I mean, I, I wasn't I wasn't sure when I took on the role of Atoy. I was tentative about it, to tell you the truth. I think what compelled me to join the project was just the caliber of talent surrounding it. The fact that Shannon Lee was on board, you know, the fact that it was being showrun by Jonathan Tropper, the fact that Justin Lin was an EP. I threw a lot of faith and trust into their talents um, and hoped that Atoy would become a very compelling character with a lot of meat to bite into. And uh, I am happy to say the gamble paid off. And Olivia, uh, Jonathan and the, the show's showrunners talked about the collaborative process of Warrior. And so I wonder if you can talk about some of the conversations that you even had with the executives about the character of Atoy. I had a conversation with Jonathan Tropper after we had an influencer screening in Los Angeles. Um, I think that would have been right before season one debuted on, you know, um, our, our first network, Cinemax. And it was actually the first time I saw the pilot in its entirety. And I remember that women at the screening walked up to me and I, I understood they were kind of making these jokes or trying, I could tell they were trying to find a way to express to me what they were uncomfortable with. But I could also tell they didn't want to personally disrespect me. And I completely, I completely understood because I, 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 there were some things in the pilot that I felt uncomfortable with, specifically when the mayor walks through um, Autoy's brothel for the first time. And it's this very choreographed, you know, group sex scene, uh, very... I think just, um, you know, it's, it, it was, it, it felt like the difference between maybe something like Deadwood that was a little more gritty and realistic versus, you know, this very fantasy-like sequence. And um, I remember I was going to write, I wrote a very long email. And then instead, I, I, I think I challenged myself to 
call JT at first. Like JT and I are now like tight, but at the time we were still kind of getting to know each other and I wasn't sure if this would go well, if it would, you know, offend him to have this conversation. But I decided to pick up the phone so that he could hear my voice and not let anything get lost in an email where, you know, you can't hear the person's tone. And we had this conversation and I basically said, you know, I love how Warrior looks out for the Asian male and our Asian brothers. I love that we are making the men fight and that we are making them so fuckable because in this country, Asian men have institutionally, historically, um, through media narratives, through so many um, uh, uh, different methods been systematically emasculated. So I love that we're taking that narrative back and doing a major course correction for that. Just please don't forget about the Asian women as well. And, um, you know, to JT's credit and all the writers, all the producers, I I, I think that was, um, I, I don't know how much that influenced things, but I appreciate that on this show, we are able to have uncomfortable conversations because progress is never perfect, but it's got to start somewhere. I certainly had those concerns as a viewer watching how Atoy was initially portrayed, right? Yeah. Because she did feed into so many of these stereotypes that are so pervasive about Asian women. Um, but I, I do have to say, like, as the seasons progressed, Atoy just became such a powerful force and even such an advocate for women. Um, and so, so unexpectedly, you know, I never thought when I first started the, sh the, the series that she would become my favorite character other than Chow. Um, <laughs> Nepo baby. There it is. But I, I find, <laughs> I find her so inspiring and her passion and her drive and her convictions just so palpable. Thank you. Thank you. Um, yeah, I, uh. And, you know, it's 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 definitely a collaborative thing because the direction the writers took her in, um, you know, really gave me something to play. And I understand. I understand the initial reaction you had to Atoy. You know, Hoon and I have had many conversations about it. He also knows the struggles I had with stepping into the character. Um, I understand that at first blush, Asian women in particular watching the role may feel very um, maybe triggered or uncomfortable or, you know, just wondering if this is going to play into um, a, a stereotype or a trope that has been very painful for many of us. But my job as an actor, and I think the job that the writers did really well is you should start to see who she is beyond what she does. And I think it's really important that we remember that we're dealing with a very specific time period. We're dealing with a very specific um, slice of Asian American history. And we have to honor that. Olivia, I think that's such a great point. And it's really important for people to recognize that during this period, right, in the 1800s, and, and I learned this yesterday, in 1852, there were about 11,000 Chinese in California, only seven of whom were women. Wow. And by 1855, women constituted only 2% of the total Chinese population in America. And because there were so many men from China pouring into the United States to, um, you know, for the gold rush and, and later for, uh, to build the, the transcontinental railroad, prostitutes began arriving in San Francisco. And another astounding statistic that I read, by the end of 1849, there were 700 prostitutes out of a total population of between 20,000 and 25,000. And that at, at a certain point, 85% of the women in Chinatown, the Chinese women, were prostitutes. So, mm. and, and also, <laughs> prostitution for a long time in this country was considered to be labor. 
um, it, it, it has since, of course, become so demonized and stigmatized, I think unfairly. But for so many years, it was actually, you know, brothels were operating legally. So I think before you judge the character, you have to really think about this character in the context of American history and, uh, and Chinese labor in San Francisco. Yeah, and I, I remember some of the conversations we had early on, Liv, and it wasn't just um, some of the the issues surrounding the type of character that Atoy was on the surface, but also the fact that, like most Asian American actors, you have a lot of experience playing sort of related characters, adjacent characters. Yeah. And there's the artistic question about, you know, am I kind of just working this one groove? Am I, am I going to be able to expand? And so I feel like for a lot of people... Um, actors in general, but, you know, particularly actors where maybe the opportunities are more constrained, you're often looking at the question of, okay, this is the person's profession or this is their place in society, but is that all I'm going to be allowed to express through the character? Is there a human being here? Is there another dimension? And um, I think that, A, we got very, very lucky with with Olivia because part of the reason why she can portray Atoy so beautifully is that she possesses all of these threads that feed into the idea of such a powerful woman. She's not only physically capable and physically beautiful, obviously, but she's witty, she's smart, she's uh, independent, and you can see that in her strength. And I think that, uh, you know, you want to be able to show those colors in order to make sure that the character is not solely defined by this one uh, classification or this one attribute. Um, and Liv, I wanted to ask you, some of my earliest scenes in the show itself were with you sitting down and having tea. I remember. And I was kind of curious. Yeah, and we were both trying to figure out who the hell these characters were, right? <laughs> who is this person? But I was wondering, is there, was there a moment where you felt like you dropped in to a toy and you felt like, ah, this is, I think this is the, the, the base I'm working from? Yes. Yes, there was. It would have been episode four, I think, of season one where a toy meets Big Bill for the first time and he already knows who she is. And he and Officer Richard Lee are raiding the brothel. And I remember my line was something like, what's going on? Um, and I played it very confrontational. I played it almost angry at first and indignant. To the credit of uh, our director at the time, David Petraka, um, and working with Kieran Bew, who is the best and plays Big Bill, David had me play the opposite, almost like feigning innocence. And in that moment, I felt like I finally found the first real vertebrae of Atoy because in that scene, I suddenly realized, oh, it's fun messing around with this white police officer. And in this really subtle, almost playful and coy way, asserting power over him. And that takes a real set of kahunas to do. And that was the first time that I was like, oh, this is the joy of being able to play someone like Atoy. Well, interestingly enough, both your characters, Atoy and Chow, do that with these white law enforcement officers. Yeah. Um, and, and that sounds like it's intentional. Yeah. You know, as a category, sometimes, uh, you know, just for organizational purposes, you're like, here are the hopway, here are the longzi, here are the police, here are the politicians. And our group is sort of the independents. And I think that it was a really lucky thing for me where we, we were able to be placed in these scenes together, um, being able to play off of each other because you, it was easier for me to try to establish a sense of history with the character because clearly these two people were like-minded, had kind of come up together maybe, and were of a similar breed, if that makes sense. So it gave these independent people who really don't have a formal affiliation, it gave them a sort of home. Um, I'm not sure, <laughs> I'm not sure if Liv felt that way, but it was really helpful in trying to find out what the history, the implied history between these characters were. It also helped locate uh, Chow in space for me. Right. So um, I thought that it was really important for me to observe sort of how our toy moved in the world so I could start to fill in some of that negative space. And your two characters are the only ones that really, outside of Assam and my Ling, sort of communicate in broken English, nevertheless, but can communicate with the non Chinese. And we have a lot of explicit dealings. Her brothel is, it's a meeting point for these cultures as well. Right. 
and these characters, they have to interact and assert themselves, really, in this environment. Um, Olivia, I'm really intrigued by the actual Atoy. Your character is one of the few that is based on a real person who I was surprised to learn, you know, certainly had her own sense of agency for the time. Can you tell us about who the real Atoy was and how you um, drew inspiration from her? Yeah, the the real Atoy is this, almost this like mythical uh, urban legend in San Francisco history. And I already knew about her before Warrior came along. I actually found out about Warrior helping friends tape for the role of Assam. And I remember when I was helping uh, my friend and I was reading the part of Atoy for his tape, I was like, huh, I wonder if this is at all based on or, you know, drawn from the real Atoy. And um, what I was able to glean about Atoy, I one the first thing I noticed was only men have written about her. Like there's there's nothing out there that I know of that is about Atoy by Atoy. So that immediately struck me that for a woman, an Asian woman of that time to in any way crack the zeitgeist of San Francisco society, she made waves. And she was a woman who uh, may have been one of the first uh, prostitutes or notorious madams of the pioneering era. And there are two different stories I found. One was, they, they both involve her coming over on a ship. Um, one said she was a slave girl who became the captain's mistress. And with the gold he paid her, she was able to come to San Francisco, rent out a uh, two-bedroom apartment, hire a couple of bouncers, and start this peep show where men would pay to come into a room. The curtain would open. She would dance a bit or, you know, kind of perform on stage and then the curtain would close and they would leave and there would be like a lineup out the door. And eventually, apparently she was able to like franchise this and she wasn't the performer anymore, but she would bring other Asian women in to be the performer on stage. And as her business grew and expanded, there were customers and, you know, tongs who would challenge her or, you know, pay her with um, fake gold. And she would take people to court. And I thought that was really incredible for um, a, a, an Asian immigrant woman of that time to infiltrate and use the American court system to her advantage, to her great success. So she was actually able to fight off, you know, uh, rival tongs, not with physical brute force, but with the American legal system. Um, and as far as I know, she left San Francisco, I, I think, and I don't know if anyone really knows what happened to her, but I like to think that she died peacefully somewhere um, living a good life. You know, Olivia, I was just thinking about, again, we, we you know, these, these stereotypes of, of Asian women being, you know, these sort of dragon ladies or hypersexualized. So as an actress, how do you dislodge those things from your stereotype and really kind of get into who this character is for that time? What are the the sort of devices that you draw on in order to inhabit this character in the 1800s? You know, my job as an actor is to do my best and do my due diligence not to judge the character, but to understand the accumulation and momentum of life situations that lead to choices upon choices upon choices that lead the character to the scene that I am playing. And one of the first things I did when, um, uh, it, it was actually research for a, another role in another show, but I ended up watching um, a lot of documentaries about sex workers from all over the world, Thailand, Mexico, India, um, America, Canada, and uh, I read any sociology report I could find because I was just trying to find a way in. And it was watching all these documentaries and suddenly realizing that 
these women have agreed to be filmed um, and they've agreed to do interviews. And it was this, the way they sat up incredibly straight and um, they literally held their chins up and they exuded this hardness because it felt like they were announcing that they are human and they have dignity. And, and that's what really struck me. I said, you know, I don't, I, I don't, I don't have the life context to viscerally understand what these women have gone through, but I can understand what it is to know that the world is judging you, to know that there's a certain violence of perception around who you must be based on what you do. And to understand what it is to go, but I know who I am and I will stand with my shoulders back, my chest out and my chin up and I will not let you break me. You know, it's so interesting to hear you explain sort of the process behind how you were finding uh, like how to mine an experience in order to build this character. And it makes me think very much that when we first meet Atoy at the beginning of the show, she's established that she's figured that formula out. She's figured out how to move through the world. But in this last season, uh, through all of the trauma that happens between her and Nelly and the vineyard, we see her have to kind of refine that. So mm. in that uh, part of the episode where Atoy, you know, goes back to the brothel, decides that Chinatown is the only place where they can be safe, we see her uh, sort of reclaim that part of her. And so, you know, you put on the red dress and, the, and all of your makeup and everything. And, and I, I wonder if you could speak to that and sort of how what you just talked about maybe informed what you were doing in this episode. You know, it's, it's, it's funny hearing you say that. And, uh, I'm only now really seeing almost the, uh, obvious parallels between what was going on for Odd Toy and what was going on for me in life, because this season in particular, I had a really, uh, tough time stepping back into the role of Odd Toy. And I, I didn't, understand why I was struggling so much as it happened. It actually really took me the months after the season ended to process a lot. And, you know, to speak to what was happening first with Atoy, you know, when we leave her in season two, she has just survived an incredibly traumatic near-death experience. And when we meet her at the beginning of season three, she just wants peace. She is just falling for the hope and the dream that that Nellie is um, offering with the safety of the vineyard and the safety of her privilege as a wealthy white woman. And I think it's understandable that Atoy wants to buy in. After everything she's been through, she wants to believe that there's a safe, clean, beautiful home available to her in America. And the trauma and grief that comes with hope being dashed, I think that is all embodied in that scene where we see Atoy go, silly me, who am I to have hoped that I could be something more than who I am in Chinatown? And not only, you know, have I paid a price for that fallacy, but it's cost the lives of girls that I was trying to do better for. And uh, I think that scene in the mirror, that scene that we take the time to see her armoring back up through the mask, through the makeup, through the wardrobe, through learning to hold her expression again in this almost like perfectly placid um uh, you know, facial expression, I think it speaks to all of that. And in terms of my own process, I think, I think I just, you know, really had to, um, you, you know, do my best with that scene. But I, I, I do look back now and I, you, you know, Lisa, I actually listened to, um, your archetypes, uh, podcast with Meghan Markle about, the archetype of the dragon lady after filming season three. And I got quite, I got quite emotional because I realized that, oh my God, like after the pandemic 
after the Atlanta spa shootings, after everything I was doing off camera during the pandemic to activate and speak out on behalf of our community with the global rise of of anti-Asian racism and hate, it was difficult for me to step back into all the things that make Atoy Atoy. You know, it was difficult to face that inner struggle again of taking on a character who is arguably or could become or could be seen as every painful Asian female trope, every painful dragon lady trope, because every press tour, I have at least one reporter call me a dragon lady in a very nonchalant, playful way. They have no idea the historical and painful connotations of that term. Um, And it makes me sad that I can't play someone strong without it being racialized. So, you know, in my life, I have really developed this kind of people pleasing quality to just try to stay safe. And that is the opposite energy of who Atoy is. So it was a real bridge for me this season to try to step back in um, and, and hope for the best. I mean, those are a lot of big feelings you were harboring. You know, how, how did you reconcile those in order to be able to, um, to, to, to play this character? And, and I mean, I would argue, you know, really create magic because I think this season, um, all of those complexities of your character just came front and center and you just, you did it beautifully. So how did you bring yourself to be able to do this? You know, I, when you asked how I reconciled those feelings, my immediate thought was, I don't think I ever did. I think that's why the season was so tough for me. I think it's more that at this level of craft and and experience I have, you just step in and you do your best to find the truth in the situation. You do your best to get out of your own way. And sometimes we're not the best judge of how well we're executing on that. But, you know, time is finite and you only get a certain number of takes and you, I, I'm, I'm really happy to hear that it it, it, it hits the audience a certain way because, I, you know, the audience shouldn't see the seams. The audience shouldn't see the actor struggling unless we're able to alchemize it on behalf of the character. So I think I just did my best to just alchemize, like, all the, 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 the gunk and just try to make, make art out of it. Olivia, I want to, um, to, to go back to the show for a minute. There's a moment um, after Atoy has... Um, gone back to the brothel, um, and you talked so beautifully about that the transformation that that takes place when she changes her clothes and puts her makeup on. Um, Assam eventually comes in and tells her she should take some time off be- before returning to work, but she tells him, "I have a business to run." Um, and then, in contrast to the vulnerability we saw when she was alone and looking in the mirror, you see her face just harden, and she says, "Do you have any idea?" how long it took to put this dress on and she goes down the stairs. Oh, it's so powerful. So well done. Tell us about that scene. That scene was, um, you know, that, that, that scene, we, uh, I I put a lot of um, importance on that scene and, uh, you know, me and Koji really on the day were really trying to, find it. Um, I think that scene, it says, it's, it's one of those scenes that, 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 that says so much. Um, I think, I think we, what I like about that scene is the audience sees more than the characters in the world do. So the audience is more privy to what's actually going on for her internally but then I think they can also understand how she is seen by the world. And I think to the credit of the editors, the writers, um, the cinematographers, how they were able to visually capture that moment, I'm, I'm really grateful for because, you know, I think we all understood that we are letting the audience be a fly on the wall in that they see things that Assam can't see because he's standing behind Atoy as she 
prepares to almost step off the edge of the cliff, if you will, and walk down those stairs back into a persona and a mask and an armor that she genuinely thought she'd left behind. Um, so, yeah, I think I, I called that scene the return of Atoy. I can't let you go, Olivia, without asking you about the fight scenes oh. <laughs> and and just what an unbelievable um, badass <laughs> of a fighter Atoy is. You know, given how much Atoy is carrying, given how much Olivia is carrying when she, um, you know, is 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 trying to portray so much in this role, tell me what it's like to not only be victorious, but to to just explore that physicality in this character. It's one of my favorite aspects of playing Atoy. Um, I was a former competitive gymnast um, in my youth, and I I love athleticism. I love that my acting career has allowed me to physically train, to be challenged um, as an athlete, to uh, pick up a weapon or pick up uh, some kind of uh, physical skill that is not natural to me, Olivia, but for the sake of a character story, I have to learn it well enough to sell it. And that stunt tent as well um, that Brett Chan um, created for us, it, it's always been such a it's always been such a haven for inspiration and socializing. It's, it's been such a social hub for us to um, see each other. And it's, I, I can't tell you how cool it is to like look around the room and everyone's working on a different sequence or training or stretching or, you know, hitting themselves in the face accidentally with a weapon. It's, it, it really does build um, a, a, a camaraderie because you feel like you're a sports team, you know, getting ready to go compete in the Olympics together or something. Um, so as an actor, I loved it. And I hope that I hope that it's fun for the audience to watch because this was definitely the most number of fights that I've had in a season. I had five different sequences, but mine were more what um, the showrunners called the popcorn fights, where it's just these like quick hits of entertainment. And I hope it comes across like that. It's an incredible power that Atoy possesses. And again, Olivia Chang, you, you just, you play her so well. And thank you for bringing such thought and heart to this character. Thank you so much for being part of the podcast. Thank you. And before you go, I have to ask you one question. Uh, you know, obviously our whole show is predicated on on the writings of Bruce Lee. And one of the things we're asking everybody is, what's your relationship with the phrase, be like water? Oh, you know, I have had to think about that or draw... Um, what's that word, nourishment, um, from that saying, uh, because as I move into different aspects of being a storyteller and as I, you know, work to, um, create my own projects and get them from concept to completion, it is not an easy road so far. And there have been so many times that my patience has been incredibly tested and sometimes I, well, not sometimes, every time I've hit those walls, I, I think about that saying, you know, I think about what are the cracks? What are the, you know, what are the um, ways that water, you know, can still break through a mountain? Um, you know, sometimes I, I, I think I was standing um, on Table Mountain and I noticed how the water had really worn down um, the surfaces of the rock and, and how incredible, like, wow, like how much time and force and uh, just consistency of water running down the mountain in that spot did it take to create that groove? Um, so, yeah, I think I think one of the beautiful things about being involved in a Bruce Lee show is Bruce Lee's philosophy um, impacts you and, and, and the be water statement, you know, I... I I, I hate to be a basic Bruce Lee bitch, but that is the quote um, <laughs> that 
<laughs> is, you know, I think arguably his most popular and well-known for a reason, because it really applies to anyone who's facing any kind of challenge that tests their patience and tests their ability to believe in themselves to actualize. That's a great Beautiful. answer. Beautiful. Beautiful. Thank you, Olivia. Thank you both. Thank you, Lisa. Thank you, Hunski. Appreciate you both. Okay, that's it for us. Until next time. That's right. We are back with a new podcast after every new episode of Warrior. So come back for more as soon as you've watched episode five. Next week, we'll be talking to the Hopway leaders themselves, Perry Young, who plays the wise but old-fashioned Father June, and Jason Tobin, who plays the loyal but impulsive Young June. It's going to be a good one. Can't wait. Stream new episodes of Warrior Thursdays only on Max and listen to the podcast on Max and wherever you listen to podcasts. The official Warrior podcast is a Max podcast produced by the Mashup Americans. It is executive produced by Amy S. Choi and Rebecca Lair. Our producers are Sarah Pellegrini and Thomas Liu. Our development producer is Nicole Kelly. Our production manager is Shelby Sandlin. The show is mixed by Pedro Rafael Rosado.